The problem with cutting carbs out in the evening, although from a logical standpoint would make a lot of sense, is that most of the evidence that is out there is relatively inconclusive. Believe it or not, most of the science that we look at when it comes down to cutting out carbs in the evening also ends up inadvertently restricting calories. The problem with cutting calories at night is the fact that most of the evidence is relatively inconclusive. And what I mean by that is most of the studies where we look at carbohydrates being restricted at night are also restricting calories or inadvertently restricting calories. So there needed to be a study that actually looked at this without restricting calories. So if we take the exact same diet, we just sort of flip-flop macronutrients a little bit, where do we land? What ends up happening? So the study that we're looking at took a look at a Mediterranean style diet with the exact same amount of calories. The only difference is that for 12 weeks, one group ate a Mediterranean style diet with more carbohydrates consolidated in the morning and the other group kind of ate them spread out evenly throughout the day. The diet itself was relatively high carb to begin with. 50% was coming from carbohydrates, 30% was coming from fat, and only 15% was coming from protein. Now, if you ask me, the Mediterranean diet is great, but it really needs more protein than that. I don't know if that's realistic. And it was a free living scenario. So basically they were able to go about their daily life, just everything was tightly controlled to make sure that calories were right where they needed to be. In this case, for the 12 weeks, they set up their calories so that they would have about a 5% reduction in their body weight over the course of 12 weeks. So they were put in a caloric deficit. However, they were both equally put in a caloric deficit. The only thing they were looking at was carbohydrate allocation. And they wanted to look at a number of different things. So they looked at their insulin resistance. They looked at their, you know, of course, their HOMA IR, their, their glucose, they looked at their body weight. Let's go ahead and break down what they found. One of the things that probably happens the most in the Mediterranean diet though, by the way, is a shift in the gut microbiome. Now, if these people were eating Mediterranean to begin with, it may not have been a huge shift, but that's one of the main effects that people see when they start eating the foods that are a little bit more Mediterranean-ish. So I put a link down below for one of our video sponsors who makes this content possible. Love it or hate it, I have sponsors on this channel because that's how we do what we do. So that link down below is a 25% off discount link for Seeds Daily Symbiotic. If you're making any change to your diet or even the timing of your diet, your gut microbiome can be your friend or it can be your enemy. So I'm always a fan of adding more in the way of benefit to your gut. So in this case, Seed is a prebiotic and a probiotic in one capsule. It's their DSO-1 Daily Symbiotic. Really cool technology with a bunch of clinicals behind it. So it's legit, legit stuff. And that link down below is a very unique link that's just for this YouTube channel and is a 25% off discount link if you use that down below. So it's just underneath this video in the top line of the description. You'll see they use a capsule inside of a capsule technology. Really, really interesting stuff. So again, that link, top line of the description, if you're making a diet change, it's probably smart to take care of your gut too. So what they found is that at a glance, People adhered to this, right? They did good. So there was a 58% increase in carbohydrate consumption in the morning, 69% decrease compared to control. So they did it okay, okay? But their body weight was about the same. Their fat mass between both groups was about the same. And even their glycemic response their, and their insulin resistance was about the same. This is kind of interesting. On one hand, it's a little frustrating because for years, so many people said, cut out carbs in the evening, it'll make a big difference, specifically with glycemic control. But now on the other hand, we see this and we're like, okay, that's kind of cool. We can have flexibility with where we space our carbs. But there are a couple glaring issues we need to address. And they're not issues, they're just realistic. This was looking at a Mediterranean diet. And even though it's a high carb diet, Mediterranean has a lot of good components to it that make it very good when it comes down to metabolic management and diabetes and insulin resistance. That's why Europe and the Mediterranean has such like lower instances of that. So in this case, could it be that the Mediterranean diet in general, even when the carbs are evenly spaced, could it be outwitting the timing system? What I mean by that is the diet is so good as a whole, it is in spite of carbohydrate timing still having a positive effect, right? So if this was the standard American diet and you messed with carb shuffling and timing, would there be a stronger effect, a more potent impact? I would be inclined to think so because the polyunsaturated fats, the monounsaturated fats, the good healthy foods that are in a Mediterranean rich diet are probably offsetting some of the weirdness that might happen with carb timing. 
The other thing we have to consider is even though statistically or as a percentage it looked like a lot of carbohydrates were moved, there was only about a 30 to 40 gram carbohydrate difference with dinner. Like there was about a 15, 16 gram of carbohydrate intake in the low carb evening group versus like a 40-ish intake, so 40 to 50 intake. So it really wasn't that much difference in carbohydrates. If we were talking a shuffling of 100 carbs, do you think there'd be a bigger impact? I'm inclined to think there would be. I'm curious your thoughts. I love reading the feedback on this. If, if they were moving more carbohydrates, would it have made a bigger dent? Makes sense it would. But I don't want to end it with just this study because we need to investigate a little bit more. So I want to take a look at a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. So this study looked at a very low carb breakfast, also pretty low protein. It was like 15 grams of protein, 75 grams fat, 10 grams of carbs. So it was very low carb. And it compared this to a control diet that was not low carb. In this case, 15 protein, 55 carb, and 30 fat. Okay, so not gigantic change, but enough to make a decent difference. Interestingly enough, the very low carb breakfast group ended up having better glucose throughout the day and a better 24 hour area under the curve, which means glycemic control bar none was better with the low carb breakfast group. So this one almost implies, hey, stack your carbs towards the evening. And to be completely frank, I sit in that camp. I'm just giving my own biases here. I think sitting in the carbs in the evening camp is better. I like stacking fats and calories in the morning and tapering as the day goes on, and I have my carbs in the evening, albeit still three hours before bed, but they're allocated there. Because I don't view carbs as immediate fuel. I view carbs as just a component that can sometimes restore glycogen and a tool when necessary, but I certainly don't use it for immediate fuel. But there was a big issue, right, that a lot of people don't look at when they look at the study. The low carb breakfast group consumed about 180 carbs total. The group that still had a higher carb breakfast although the calories were the same, ended up having about 280 carbs throughout the course of the day. So remember, calories were matched, but carbs weren't matched. What they should have done is actually just allocated carbs and had them consume more in the evening, and then we would have gotten a better view. At the end of the day, what they did is they just removed carbs from the breakfast meal and added more calories in other places. So yeah, in this case, although some people would still negate this, it's pretty clear that just reducing carbohydrates by about 100 grams in general, if a high carb diet, is still gonna have a huge improvement on HOMA IR and area under the curve for 24 hours. What does that mean? It means if you're dealing with metabolic issues, there is a benefit to reducing carbs. There is, despite what a lot of people say. But let's look at more literature. But what if we look at this with no caloric restriction? Like we say, okay, eat as much as you want, ad libitum sort of free living for early time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. So this study was published in Nutrition Metabolism. It took one time-restricted group that could only eat between 8 a.m. and 6 p.m., which is really just kind of real life. It's not that bad. It's a, what, 10-hour eating window? And they compared that to a 12-hour eating group. And what they found with this is they could let them eat ad libitum as much as they want. The time-restricted feeding group ended up losing 6.6 .6 pounds, having improvements in HbA1c and area under the curve, but we ran into another problem. Even in an ad libitum situation, the group that was time-restricted feeding ended up eating significantly less. It sounds like a problem because in the case of the study, it is. But in real life, you put two people in free living conditions and tell them to eat as much as they want, as long as they really want to, as long as they're eating within these hours. And the people that were eating in the shorter hours actually ate less. So, and this is over time. This is 12 weeks. So like any compensation effect that would occur didn't occur. Right? So it's like people would say, well, fasting, you know, you're going to restrict your calories to a certain time. You're just going to make up for it later. Didn't seem to happen in 12 weeks. I mean, you might kind of make it up in the long term, but realistically, over the course of 12 weeks, they lost weight and they did not feel deprived. But that doesn't answer our question about the carbs, about the timing. I think with the carbs, it's somewhat settled that it doesn't matter as much unless it's junk food, then you can probably offset it. But there was the first intermittent fasting study, the first human controlled feeding supervised study done that was really interesting. Let's talk about it. This was published in Cell Metabolism and it gave subjects exactly enough food, exactly enough food to maintain their weight. Not caloric restriction at all, not ad libitum, just enough to maintain their weight. Now here's what's interesting though. It was a five week study. One group ate within a 12 hour eating block, which is actually pretty good. It was like seven to seven or something. The other one was a very short eating period. Okay, it was like a six hour eating window and they couldn't eat past 
3 p.m. But they ate as many calories as the other group. So calories were matched to keep them at the even weight. They really wanted to see, was there any benefit metabolically independent of weight loss at all? If we just kept these people at even weight, not giving them the same calories, but giving them exactly how much they need to maintain weight so they don't lose weight. They wanted to offset any benefit that would occur from weight loss. So no weight loss. And they still found this. Insulin sensitivity improved. Beta cell function, so like insulin production, pancreatic cells, improved. Reactive oxygen species went down like basically they had a reduction in oxidative stress independent of losing weight and they had a decrease in appetite despite the fact that calories were set to keep them at the same weight. The first supervised controlled feeding. So we do have some solid human evidence in a very clinical supervised setting that restricting when it's more aggressive has benefits there. Does it answer our carb question? No. If you're eating over a 12 hour block, I don't think it matters when you have your carbs as much, except for the fact that having the carbs in the evening might help you sleep. And I also recommend, based on BMC Medical Genomics research, that, hey, if you have your calories stacked towards the morning, you might end up being a little bit better as the day goes on. Breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. But we do see in the evidence that with more aggressive fasting, six hour eating windows, there are metabolic benefits independent of the actual weight loss. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.